uh, con concept within the panoply of how we do black feminist theorizing. So if you give me a minute, can you see, can you see this slide? Yes. Okay. Well, basically I want to first of all describe what black feminist theory is. Sorry about that. Our black reproductive futurism and it's a black feminist theory on reproductive science and technology that prioritizes black women's reproductive experiences. Too often our reproductive experiences are ignored really in terms of understanding that we have a particular standpoint because of the re reproductive oppression that we've experienced because of white supremacy and capitalism. And so we really are determined to theorize our way and to create new practices to address the particular reproductive oppression that is visited on black bodies. When I think as a reproductive futurist, I really want to ask these, these questions of myself and hope that we can generate a real critical discussion on these things. Like how will applying the principles of reproductive justice differ in the near future because our conditions are always changing and we need to understand that with the experience of Henrietta Lacks having her DNA patented and commodified in a very commercialized way with no compensation paid to her or her family, we need to understand how we enshrine a genetic individual as a political subject with inalienable human rights so that we don't have more Henrietta Lacks. And since reproductive justice is based on the human rights framework and that itself is a nation's based accountability system, how will, when we have these shifts in national borders, how will that affect implementation of a rights-based system in which national borders are extremely porous and increasingly irrelevant? We certainly see how crime, how money, how pandemics, how refugees, how environmental problems cross borders. And so borders are becoming an outdated way of addressing our global problems and really the only thing borders are succeeding in doing is locking down workers, not allowing workers to travel as freely as the corporations that hire these workers are able to go. And since neoliberal capitalism is in crisis, we need to really experiment and think about what different philosophical or economic theories should be considered in order to move forward. And I believe that the power relations that we presently experience will be mutating as they try to protect the white supremacist structure the same way that you see Trump now trying to delegitimize an election because the world's gonna reshuffle and these demographics that the US is facing is actually happening worldwide. And when people of color become a majority of people in the United States, we need to be prepared to apply the principles of reproductive justice in these changing contexts. As someone who believes in black liberation, I'm always looking at the demographics of what's happening. And of course, within a short brief 30 years, white people are gonna be a minority within a nation of minorities. And climate change will probably produce about 200 million global refugees by the middle of this century, the same time that we're gonna have all this racialized conflict as white people become unwilling to accept their new minoritized status. And that's gonna challenge these borders of these nation states. As I said earlier, because governments are losing control over information, et cetera. And white supremacist nationalists will probably demand an upgraded form of imperialism, apartheid and segregation and other undemocratic policies to preserve white privileges. And we're seeing the active deconstruction of democracy in plain sight. And they've been working on this for the last 50 years or 50, almost longer 
since the Brown v. Board of Education decision in 1954 that ordered schools to, the, to desegregate. And I think we're at a risk of perpetual external and internal wars justified to secure national resources, particularly from Africa. And so we're going to have to look at how reproductive justice has to be flexible to respond to these increasing changes. And I think that reproductive futurists have to look at how scientific and technological developments like facial recognition technology, for example, will, will enable the upgrading of social and economic inequalities. And this is, of course, going to cause changes in governments, corporations, and how nonprofits operate. So when Black women theorize reproductive justice in a futuristic pattern, we, we realize that we've got several things we have to fight. We have to fight population control and eugenics directed towards Black women. We have to build a human rights framework to overcome the limits of the US Constitution, which of course was created by white slave owners. And we've been frustrated in our amendment of the Constitution. And like uh, Vincent Harding said a long time ago, we're citizens of a country that's never been because we have this ongoing unending civil war based on whether or not the United States is gonna be a country of freedom and equality or a republic dominated by white property owning men. And we need to offer a forward looking and intersectional framework for building our power in communities of color. And in this, I think black women are naturally going to lead this because we lead in conceptualizing things like intersectionality, reproductive justice, identity politics, and now reproductive futurism so that we can get ahead of and anticipate the new theories and practices that we're going to need. And we always believe that reproductive justice in the past, in the present and the future has to offer a critique of white supremacy and neoliberalist racialized capitalism. One of the strengths of black women theorizing is to offer a strategic vision and practical movement building guideposts for centering the most vulnerable margins, uh, most marginalized voices in the center of the lens. And that allows us to shift the entire pyramid. Because if you shift the bottom of the pyramid, the whole thing shakes. And we've already theorized that the connections between reproductive health, service delivery, reproductive rights, which primarily deals with abortion advocacy, and reproductive justice as a movement building through organizing framework and how these th three portions of our movement work together in tandem and how they need to change. For example, now that we have the availability of the abortion pill, can we theorize how abortion clinics are going to have to change their service delivery model or with telemedicine, <clears throat> excuse me, because of COVID. Now reproductive health service delivery is going to change. And so as we look towards the 21st century to address these new challenges and changes, con changing conditions, we need reproductive futurism as a new form of black women's theorizing. Of course, what we're dealing with is the criminalization of Black women's bodies. And this is what reproductive justice was created for in the first place, to address the use of stereotypes like Mammy, Sapphire, and Jezebel, to portray Black women as unnatural. And we are constantly experiencing the punishment of Black reproduction through child welfare system, over-policing through the criminal injustice system, legal and illegal, and coercive sterilization abuse, as we saw in the ICE detention facilities here down in Georgia, that has been exposed as a form of genocide, a crime against humanity. And they quickly, of course, trying to deport the black and brown bodies on which these abuses took place and the disposabilities of black bodies through discrimination. Like there's a black woman in Florida now who again, uh, 
like Marissa Alexander is being uh, is unallowed to use the stand your ground laws when the police were improperly bursting through a window in her home and she thought it was a burglar and she shot and now they're trying to, of course, prosecute her for shooting someone breaking into our house who did not announce that they were police before they broke in. And of course, the promotion of dangerous contraceptives like long acting reversible contraceptives or LAR are Deborah Rivera hoisted on black women without giving them full information about the benefits and risks of these contraceptives. And in fact, making too few contraceptive options available so that women have, the black women have limited choices in the first place. And like the National Advocates for Pregnant Women talks about in Dorothy Roberts in her writing, reproductive punishment through pregnancy policing. And that means punishing women um, particularly black women for not following doctor's orders or doing what others think they should be doing while they're pregnant, like avoiding the abuse of drugs and things like that. And many arrests for black, of black women for abortions, particularly if they're self-medicated abortions or self-induced abortions. And of course, every mother mourns the killing of black children through state and non-state violence. So we recognize that the murder of Trayvon Martin was reproductive injustice, the murder of uh, Ahmaud Arbery and Brianna Taylor and on and on. These, of course, are reproductive violences that are visited, particularly on Black mothers because of the out of control uh, police and industrial complex and the lack of remedies through the legal system that really doesn't afford Black women much relief because it ignores or minimizes our pain and our suffering. Of course, women's fertility is always the focus because every empire needs bodies for their labor force, for their armies, uh, for their economy, for the suppression of other communities. And so when you talk about reproductive controls, it transcends the fertile body to include a range of policies. Some are obvious, like sterilization abuse, but some are not as obvious, like the way that they use property taxes to control school funding, almost guaranteeing that the lower valued black properties will produce less funding for schools in the black community. And consistently over time, people have tried to control the fertility of women going from the ancient Greek and Roman empires. And in fact, Emperor Augustus was concerned about the failing birth rates of upper-class Roman women, and he urged them to have more children. And even though the perspectives of ancient Roman women were not documented because the historians of that day didn't think women's voices were worth recording, we can certainly speculate that the emperor wouldn't have been concerned if women were having too many babies. In fact, they were having too few. And he failed to recognize that the Roman women had access to birth control and abortion information from Africa that the Roman empire had encapsulated and transmitted this ancient Egyptian information about fertility control that the Roman women were taking advantage of. And of course, in reproductive population management in 1873 in the United States, Postmaster General Comstock passed the law to, as part of fulfilling America's manifest destiny to complete the genocide of indigenous populations and to populate the United States with white inhabitants. And so he prohibited the distribution of birth control information and devices by calling them obscene, lewd, and lascivious. And even the American Medical Association led an 1880 campaign to ban abortion in the US because they did not like the competition for midwives. And in the black community, it was granny midwives who were providing not only most of our reproductive health care, but from birth to death, they were providing most of the health care that black communities were receiving because of discrimination 
in the formal medical system that disallowed us to get competent health care. And so they were pretty thorough in their trying to push midwives and now doulas out of the medical care system. And of course, we've had a resumption of this undervaluing and dismissing of midwives and doulas in the midst of the COVID crisis, because they're using COVID as an excuse to push, push midwives and doulas out of birthing rooms nowadays. And Francis Galton was the cousin to Charles Darwin, and he invented the concept of eugenics in 1883 in England. And it was quickly embraced by the elites of England at the time because they wanted an, an analysis that, that addressed the civil unrest that was happening as England industrialized. And so many people were being pushed off of their lands and paid slave wages. And they rather have a genetic explanation for the civil unrest than accept that it was economic and structural why the working class and the poor people of Eng England were so agitated and fighting for their rights. And so once the work, the elites had a genetic explanation for the civil unrest, of course, it quickly got adopted by the United States starting at the beginning of the 20th century so that we ended up with eugenics being embraced as a philosophy for a country that already had fascistic tendencies like the United States as justifications for what they call positive eugenics, increasing the birth rates of white women and negative eugenics, decreasing the birth rate of all people who were not white. And even that, you had to be a certain kind of white to be allowed to reproduce because the first sterilization case that went to the Supreme Court was of Carrie Buck, who in uh, 1927 was ruled to be off-white because she was not white and middle class. She was a white woman. She was a poor white woman who got raped by the son of her employer as she worked as a domestic worker. And because she became pregnant because of this multiple rape she experienced, they defined her as mentally deficient. And so eugenics also takes place on white women who are described as not the right kind of white. But of course, its major targets were black women, Native American women, Puerto Rican women, uh, disabled people and people who were in control, in the control of institutions, state-run institutions, like people who were incarcerated, people were, who were in uh, mental health facilities and so on. And I would argue that the current restrictions on abortion, birth control, and sex education are all part of a scheme to increase the facility, uh, the fertility of, for heterosexual white women and decrease it for everybody else, also known as reproductive oppression. And one of the things I've observed that we're going to have to address as a Black reproductive futurist analysis is how new terms are coming up that basically describe eugenics, like population stabilization, population time bomb, which is kind of old, and population dynamics, and even another term they call population justice, as if they can co-opt the framework of reproductive justice and rebrand it and attach it to eugenics. An African philosopher named Achille Mbembe has created the term necropolitics, and it talks about the disposability of Black bodies, and we need to look at how necropolitics will evolve over the next few uh, decades as part of the 21st century, because it's the use of social and political power to dictate how some people may live and how some people may die. It describes the politics of disposability. Who, are, who is given the necessary conditions to have a safe, fruitful, peaceful life, and who is targeted as a poison on the body politic. And they, of course, are targeted for elimination or at least reduction. 
I would argue that Native American people are targeted for reproductive disappearance, while I think Black people are targeted for reproductive management and, and control. Biopower is a concept that Michel Foucault talked about, which is the use of social and political power to control people's lives. And so uh, Mbembe took Foucault's concept and, cre and extended it to particularly talking about what's happening on the African continent, but also how we can describe that, that effect of necropolitics here within our minoritized populations here in the United States, particularly the Black, Native American, the queer, uh, the, the Me Mexican Americans or Latinx populations, et cetera. And so when you use reproductive justice futurism, you have to examine how scientific and technological advances are actually replicating the power disparities that will enable the upgrading of current injustices against Black bodies. And so, for example, you've got to look at new genetic um, editing technologies that are rapidly being adopted in laboratories around the world, because this is enabling researchers and fertility doctors to create genetically altered, even what they call genetically enhanced humans. And in fact, in 2018, they conducted an experiment that resulted in the birth of twin gene edited babies. And even though a lot of people widely condemn this as reckless and premature, the proponents or advocates of heritable geno uh, genetic editing double down and they really want to push forward with this technology. And this debate is filling from the scientific and biotech industry into policy, uh, public regulation, and civil society circles. And it's now urgent that human rights and reproductive justice activists challenge this permanently altering the human genome so that the future of children is affected without any actual benefits to the parents of these children. And they're pushing it is that, well, we can stop, you know, inheritable diseases like Down syndrome without really examining the framework that doesn't even support the parents of children who are disabled. And so it's not addressing the existing social inequalities, but trying to offer using the bodies of people who suffer social inequalities as an excuse to have adopt to adopt genetic gene modification for commercial purposes and really recreate a market-based eugenics that would exacerbate existing discrimination, inequalities, and conflict. And so we're going to need a paradigm shift to totally to a totally different worldview towards what I believe is the ancient African philosophy of Ubuntu based on human interdependence, which of course the COVID virus has, has revealed as being utterly necessary versus the alienation of the European philosophy, philosophical systems that we currently work under. We're also gonna have to critique the monetization of all life and human needs, because you, these human needs are, their, are our human rights, like our need for water, air, clean environment, food, shelter, education, healthcare, safety, and peace. Because we need a new social contract for life. And a social contract is the deal that you make with your government for the taxes that you pay, what the government should be providing in exchange for those taxes. And right now we have a withering a destruction of the social contracts under a neoliberal racialized capitalist system. We also are gonna to have to challenge the commodification of white women's bodies and white babies because this undergirds all reproductive injustices in our public policies because they're doing race-based social engineering. For example, although the teen pregnancy rate in America has gone down for almost every ethnic or racial group in one population, the teen pregnancy rate is going up, and that's among white 
evangelical teenagers. And so it's actually their, their, their social engineering is producing the result that they want, but it's not fair to those teenage mothers, nor is it fair to society as a whole to have all of these restrictions on birth control, abortion, and evidence-based sex, ed sex ed education as a way of manipulating the fertility of white women. And we also need to critique international development policies that permit pharmaceutical companies to exploit the vulnerabilities of our human populations, particularly in the global South, Africa and Asia in particular, by using market-based approaches instead of human-centered strategies. We cannot fail to take advantage of the way the Treatment Action Coalition, for example, demanded a reduction in the prices of HIV drugs after a human-based and a human-centered movement made the pharmaceutical make these drugs available. And we're going to have to do it probably with the pandemic, COVID drugs, and on and on. And one thing reproductive futurism really considers is the connection between literature and science because black women write science and technology into our fiction all the time to offer powerful evidence about our experiences with reproduction. When I talk about white supremacy, I wanna be clear that I'm not just talking about racism. We need to talk about settler colonialism, Christian nationalism, nativism, xenophobia, anti-Semitism, biological determinism, the belief that your biology is destiny and what race you are born determines what quality of life you deserve, homophobia, transphobia, ableism, classism, misogyny, Islamophobia, and authoritarianism. And all of these elements of white supremacy are present in America, have always been present in America, and are what we are contending with when we wanna have a substantive and capacious analysis of the challenge that we are facing as we're trying to offer this new black feminist theory on reproductive futurism to the common, to the commons, to the intellectual commons. Of course, at a SPARC conference, I don't have to talk about what are reproductive justice principles, but just in case, I put them up here because every woman, and we should say every person has the human right to have a child, not to have a child and the parent, the children that they have in safe and healthy environments. And in 2012, Sister Song added a fourth reproductive justice principle that says that individuals have the human right to disassociate sex from reproduction and healthy sexuality and pleasure are essential components to a whole and full human life, right, human life. And this fourth principle was raised to highlight the inclusion of gender nonconforming people and trans people in the reproductive justice framework. And again, I don't have to go over this too much for SPARC people, but there are three components of the reproductive justice model, reproductive health, which focuses on service delivery, reproductive rights, which focuses on legal advocacy, and reproductive justice, that is a movement building human rights organizing framework. I've coined this term when reproduction is controlled through eugenics, I call it reposide, it's genocide through a reproductive means. And in the past, we had forced breeding, sterilization, genocide, of course, just wiping people out, segregation, restrictive immigration, forced abortions, infanticide, and dangerous contraceptives. Now, we, in the present, we have all of the methods of the past, plus now, sex selection, embryo screening, selective abortions, uh, a gamete donor selection, family eugenics, and non-biological methods like taxes. And in the future, what we're going to have to anticipate is all those past practices, plus an increase in pre-implantation uh, pre diagnosis and screening, reproductive cloning, 
inheritable genetic modification and the world of designer babies. And it's not hard for a black feminist to be skeptical of believing that designer babies will be black or brown. And so we have to remember our core reproductive justice standards of intersectionality, human rights, centering vulnerable people, linking local conditions to global conditions, understand that individuals are related to the structures and affected by the structures of inequality. We need to address the cultural assumptions that create medical racism as the Black Mom Mamas Matter Alliance is paying attention to with the sharp increase of Black maternal mortality, for example. We need to always focus on building power through coalitional work, and we need to understand that reproductive justice, because it's a human rights-based framework, it includes everyone. And we believe, and this is how we're going to have to stand on these values in a reproductive futurist context, that sexual freedom and autonomy can and must determine one's sexuality and gender identity are key ingredients to reproductive justice for individuals and communities. And it's not reproductive justice at all if it doesn't fight white supremacy and population control because these are vital for achieving reproductive justice. And so any analysis calling it the present reproductive justice or the futurist reproductive justice that does not include an analysis of global reproductive politics and don't incorporate deconstructing white supremacy, neoliberal capitalism and imperialism is not reproductive justice. Reproductive justice is not just a branding campaign. And we must work with other social justice movements to build a new human rights movement to save our lives and those of our community. So, Reproductive justice in the present and in the future recognizes that the ability of any person to determine what happens to their body is directly related to what's happening in their community. An undocumented pregnant woman who's hesitant to go for reproductive health care can't do so because of the repression that is visited towards people without documentation. A trans person who needs reproductive health care may not be able to get adequate health care because there currently are too few services that are designed to center the needs of trans individuals in their health care provision. And so what you can individually do is totally tied to what happens in the community in which you're embedded. And because we're always talking about population control, we know that controlling people's body is the pathway towards controlling entire communities through the logics of eugenics. And now there's so much academic racism and white supremacy, like the bell curve and all kinds of resurgence of white supremacist thinking through the academic institutions as well as public discourse. And whether or not you have human rights protections or violations will always determine an, an individual's ability to exercise self-determination and be free from violence and coercion. And this is going to be equally urgent in the future, as I say, as we see scientific and technological upgrades increasing the vulnerability of people. And we have these new strategies based on reproductive justice, new theories and new practices because I believe that we're the reproductive justice wing of the human rights movement. I like this definition for reproductive justice from Asian communities for reproductive justice now called Forward Together. And they said, when women, girls, and individuals have the economic, social, and political power and resources to make healthy decisions about our bodies, our labor, sexuality, and reproduction for ourselves, and our families, and our communities, in all areas of our lives, that's when reproductive justice will be achieved. But as a reproductive futurist, I'm again saying, how will it be maintained? And I want to close 
by playing this film, short film that speaks to my concerns. See if I can get it going. It may or not may not work for me because I'm not good at playing embedded films. The Romans in the time of Julius Caesar were totally preoccupied by the fear that they were not producing enough children. The sterile uh, pagan nobility died out with them, their ancestors' idea of Rome. No one wanted to have any children and no one wanted to get married. catastrophically falling birth rates, well below the replacement level. It's entirely possible that the French will disappear. There will be no native-born French that come from the traditional of a French uh, population. What some call the demographic winter of Western societies. It's happening in rich countries, it's happening in poor countries, it's happening in Catholic countries, Islamic countries, and that is everywhere People are having fewer and fewer children. Never in history have we had economic prosperity accompanied by depopulation. When there are many too many old people and not very many young people to work and to look after them, which is what's on the books now, uh, mathematically speaking. You're going to have economic collapse, there won't be enough people to run the trains or pay the taxes. For those of us who uh, were raised to believe in the teachings of Thomas Malthus or Charles Darwin, for example, these trends are very hard to absorb. And for such a small nation as Latvia, it might even endanger the, the survival of the nation. The only way you can sort of preserve the theory is to say, well, certain kinds of human beings are on the way to extinction. of social science that makes it absolutely clear that the deterioration of marriage and the encouragement of sexuality outside of marriage is just not, it's not good for society, women, children, or men. On every measure ever measured by the social sciences, the intact married family is the strongest on every outcome ever measured. We as the policymakers think that the best way um, to improve the demographic situation is by strengthening the families. It's also true, I think, for people who are worried about women's rights, about the gay rights, about environmentalism. All of these movements are deeply informed by a 1970s era preoccupation with the so-called population bomb. I'm going to stop there. <clears throat> I can certainly go on, but I wanted to show that film to you. It's called Demographic Winter. That's a trailer for it. I want you to notice that how carefully they never said the word race, but they kept using euphemisms like the French population will disappear, that there's something wrong without a stable nuclear family, that all this sexual freedom and this and the guy almost choked on the word gay as he was saying it. These people, this one was made in 2008. So our opponents to human rights are way ahead of us in strategizing how they can preserve the dominance of the white population in both America, Canada, and in other European countries, as well as Australia. And so we need a reproductive futurist approach that goes way beyond 
uh, country's preoccupation with abortion to talk about necropolitics and the disposability of Black lives in the past. I've seen that some folks who are attending have been answering each other's questions. We've had a lot of folks just like giving thanks for your um, all of the gems that you dropped on us today, um, saying you're phenomenal. Thank you for this gift. And oh my goodness, I think this was the perfect way to round off all of the conversations we've been having this weekend and really thinking about how we continue to move forward and what future strategies need to look like, right? So thank you for all of that. And if you were to leave us with one thing, one call to action, what would that be? Um, tell our truth and be awed by the results. You never go wrong by telling your truth. You only go wrong when you try to hide your truth. Wonderful. Thank you, Loretta Ross. We appreciate you. We love you. We value you. And we just um, are so thankful for your time today. So thank you so much, everyone. Please give a round of applause virtually, put in the, the chat, everything. Oh my goodness. Thank you so much. This was amazing. Spark Reproductive Justice Now. Please add us at Spark RJ Now. Hashtag Justice Now 2020. Now is capitalized take selfies of this, uh, you know, put put little quotes and what have you, tag us so we can repost. But thank you so much, Loretta Ross. We appreciate you. <sighs> I'm full. Thank you so much, everyone. We'll see you at our closing in about less than five minutes. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Right, and I'm going to send you the Power Deck, the PowerPoint oh, please, Deck. Please, and we will share it on the app. All right. Thank you. Thank you.